you know, we keep bringing in quality tight ends. Garen Justice is bringing in offensive linemen that are great. Um, you know, so it's it's not like we're struggling everywhere. Um, granted, DB isn't the only position that we're struggling to recruit right now, uh, but it's definitely probably one of the worst positions that we're recruiting. And so I don't want to give Rumpf a pass just because our team's been bad because other other guys are still pulling it off. Well, it, to 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 double, I'll I'll even add to that. Um, I would say, considering how good Miami's defense has been under Manny Diaz, uh, outside of the defensive line, the rest of the just general depth, and, and you can make an argument at safety. Obviously, they landed Avante Williams on signing day and stolen from Florida, which is great. And I think I think Gervon and Bubba Bolden and Amari Carter are talented players but there's also some some other holes in this defense that I think yeah. don't get addressed and 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 to me one of them was linebacker and yeah. to be to be frank we got lucky that Zach McLeod elected to take that red shirt yeah. because oh. if not we wouldn't have a single linebacker oh, that we started so. more than one game last year yeah oh, uh, we, St- Wayne and Steed would be our starting linebacker yeah or Amari yeah. Car- yeah, and, and I, I I think I tweeted this today at at um, Marsh, but I think Carter should be a linebacker. Uh, yes, I, thank you. I, I think it makes total sense. He should be right next to whether it be McLeod or Sam Brooks or Avery Huff, which I mean everyone wants to. I don't, I'm, I'm I'm excited for Avery Huff because it, it seems very obvious that the talent was there. He just needed to figure things out and and get his reps. But but to me, everything that I understood after watching last season was that Amari Carter struggles the most in coverage, that he's much more of an in the box type of safety. And when, you know, if, if, if Manny Diaz ever wants to get this defense to the absolute peak level, you got to have a guy who can go sideline to sideline and thump. And, and look, I'm not saying, you know, Sam Brooks can't do that because we've only seen one sample size, one game sample size from him. And it wasn't a bad game by all means, but you could tell that, you know, he was kind of lost at times, but I don't, I don't think, I don't think McLeod is that guy at all. I think McLeod is a good middle linebacker who can kind of plug up the block, the box and, and blitz the A and B gap. But, but Carter to me seems athletic enough to make those plays at the line of scrimmage while also roaming I, I've seen some people throw out the idea of him being a striker, which I'm all for as well. I, I think that that kind of suits his skill set as well. But Carter to me seems like a guy when you look at him f- physically, he he fits that linebacker mold. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and I and I uh, tweeted. Uh, we were talking today on Twitter. I'm like, when I was watching the O2 FSU Miami game yesterday, I was I saw Jonathan Billman. They were talking about how was he, how he was undersized, but you know he had that quickness that those old Miami defense liked, and I immediately thought of Amari Carter. And, I mean, you you bring up a great point. He's not a cover guy. I mean, I've, I've seen him in practice. I've seen him in games. He's not a cover guy. But when you – especially when you blitz him and you put him up near the line of scrimmage, the dude is an athletic freak. I mean, he's built like the Terminator. So why are you, like, dropping him back into coverage when you can bring that, you know, you know up to those offensive linemen? And so – I would love to see him go to a, a linebacker. I think he needs to bulk up a little bit, but um, no, I was glad that, that you brought that up. Yeah, no, I, I love that idea. I think uh, safety and defensive end are really the only positions on defense where we have a, you know, a, a, um, a good accumulation of depth and talent. Um, and so like, let's start, let's start redistribu- you know, redistributing that talent elsewhere across the defense when, where we can. Uh, cause I'm, I'm with you a hundred percent Tito. I'm, I, I talk about it all the time. I am so scared about our linebacking depth. Um, you know, it's, I, it's a, it's a serious issue. Yeah. Yeah. I think people are banking on, and I, I mean, this isn't the most popular opinion. I think we're a little too confident in Zach McLeod even. I mean, people are kind of just calling him our rock, but you know, he was kind of the odd man out last year. Um, I, I know he took his red shirt, um, you know, as a favor to Manny, and, and it was probably the best career decision, but, um, like, you know, he he lost out on musical chairs. He was our third-best linebacker last season. 
So there, I mean, there was a reason why he wasn't starting. Um, so I, I think it's a little premature to to feel super comfortable about him being a rock in the middle of the defense. Yeah, I I may I think I made this point with you guys last time, and and and, it, and it's a weird line of thinking to go by, which is I, I I'm not expecting this linebacker group to be better, but what I will say is that if if the if the prototypical linebacker that Manny wants, eventually the guys like Sam Brooks, Avery Huff, um, uh, I even think a, a guy that people, um, a guy that I'm actually excited to see develop in this program is Tarek Austin Cave. Um, uh, him and, and potentially Corey Flagg. I know Corey Flagg is pretty athletic as well. It, if those guys develop into the way I think Manny and Blake Baker kind of envision them to, then I think they're going to fit schematically better uh, of the responsibilities required in this defense. Because I keep, I, I keep referencing this because we are we're no longer just a regular 4-3. I think we're more 4-2-5 we're more than anything now than anything else. So I, I keep trying to tell people that when you have that 4-2-5, those, those two guys in the middle have to be athletic freaks. And I think, you know, Tarek Austin Cave fits that. I think – Obviously, Corey Flagg could potentially be that. Avery Huff is supposed to be. Hold on one second. My dog is freaking out right now. <laughs> You're all good. All right, y'all can edit that out real quick if y'all, if y'all can. Um, but not to like to just to to summarize it. I guess I would say is um, McLeod, like you said, doesn't really fit. And 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 you're right. He he had his moments where he looks out of place. Um, I think sometimes he takes bad angles. The hip rotation isn't exactly ideal in terms of covering receivers, but without question, he's a he's our immediately our best tackling linebacker. He's our most knowledgeable linebacker. Um, I think he gets a bad rap for his athleticism. I think he he's been a an unfortunate victim to injuries at times, so I think that's maybe slowed down his mobility. But at the same time, if it's an option to have him or to not have him, you're obviously going to take him. Yeah, and it, hopefully it, his experience can kind of brush off on a guy like a Sam Brooks and Avery Huff, a you know Tarek Austin Cave. So I I, I think you're right. I, I think ultimately, I mean, the depth is concerning because if if one person goes down, then we're really looking at a thin a thin linebacker group. God forbid two people go down. But if I'd have the to guys see. like Avery, yeah, if if Avery Huff and you know, maybe we get a contribution from Trek Austin Cave better than we thought we would get. Uh, I think we're in better shape, but it, it is a shaky group, no question about it. Okay, well let's um let, let's talk about something happier and more positive. Um, today I uh, I wrote an article on one of my favorite hurricanes, Jacory Harris. And Tito, I saw you, and a lot of people were you know giving the article crap because I called Jacory Harris a Miami legend. And I want to thank you because you you stood up for me and you were you were on the Jacory train. Have you always been a Jacory fan? I have, I, I have, and I and I have always kind of felt that, uh, in terms of looking back at Jacory's career, while we were in the moment, we didn't really appreciate it because I mean, not in all things considered, he was somewhat of a turnover machine. But I ultimately think he he got a pretty raw deal at Miami uh, for the, for the reasons I, I laid out um, one of them being that, you know, in his four years, he had three offensive coordinators. The first one being the absolute worst offensive coordinator in the, in the history of Miami. That was Patrick Nix. Uh, uh, and, and Enos. And yeah. I mean, Enos. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I guess Enos was also pretty God awful. I, I, I'll say this. I, I, and I, and I, I know it sounds like a very controversial point, I think Enos's offense isn't bad. It's his re- it's refusal to adapt and, and work with what he was given. Um, I, I think it is an indictment though that he he literally didn't land a quarterback job after leaving Miami. He he became a running backs coach at Cincinnati. <laughs> at Cincinnati. So um, yeah, I think Jacory, you know, for for everything for all the flack people like to give him. Um, Want, put up put up some really gaudy numbers while he was at Miami. You know he was splitting reps with Robert Marv, 
his freshman season. Awful decision made by Patrick Nix. Uh, then in 2009, obviously, we have that explosive year where, you know, he was a Heisman candidate at one point and um, go up to Tallahassee, the opening game of the season, and we pull off that incredible win where he looked like a superhero. Um, and, I mean, if – I, I always say this. Ja'Cory Harris was one of the most prolific quarterbacks in South Florida history. Um, I know the defensive coordinator who told me that Ja'Cory Harris was calling plays for Miami Northwestern because of how comfortable he was in that offense. I mean, he's running a spread option offense at the high school level, all based off of memory. And if he, I think if he had gotten the opportunity to run a true spread at Miami, you know, because he came to Miami and we kind of forced him to be that pro spread mix. And, you know, it, it, what would Ja'Cory look like in, in an LSU offense where they're spreading the ball out with four or five wide receivers? Uh, what would Ja'Cory Harris look like if he was at Oregon where he can, you know, have insane athletes around him where he can dump the ball off and, and make easy decisions? I, I think the pro offense really uh, – set him back um ultimately his propensity for turnovers was, was an issue as always but i i think to to not consider him one of our i mean i don't, I don't know I, I, you could probably say top three qbs we've had in the last 15 years i think that's that's insane well i mean that's not saying much i mean you got kaya and then who kirby freeman uh steven morris I oh, I, uh, steven morris, morris. Yeah, he was chill he was yeah. chill yeah, Morris is another guy who got a raw deal, uh, yeah. especially in 2013 when Golden made him made him play with the Achilles injury and stuff. So yeah, I I personally you know would would take Morris over Harris, um, but I do think you're onto something with the with the offense thing. I'm, I I just pulled up his numbers, and uh, so under Jed Fish, who is arguably well, I would pretty comfortably say he's the best offensive coordinator we've had recently. Um, so his senior year, he was definitely much more efficient as, as a passer. Um, I mean, it was his highest QB rating. It was his best touchdown interception ratio. Um, and we did air things out a little more and, you know, had, had more of a a spread look than, uh, than your traditional Canes archaic pro style offense. Um, so I, I think you're onto something there with that. Um, but I don't know. I, my my take is very emotional <laughs> when it comes to Harris because he just ripped my heart out so many times, throwing forty eight picks in oh. his career. <laughs> that so. North Carolina game, dude, in oh nine. Yeah, that was a bad one. That was a bad one. Would yeah, you? But but here's the question, and I want to ask you um, because would because of those two to three games, the FSU, uh, Georgia Tech, and Oklahoma game, would you classify him as a Miami legend? Ja'Cory Harris. Uh, <laughs> I, I, look, I, I, I think he's without question one of the more notable players in the last couple of years we've had. I think the, to coin him as a legend is a stretch, and maybe that's just because of the weight that term carries. Um, but I, you know, because when, when I think of a legend, I think of somebody that is associated with the logo of the university. And I don't think Ja'Cory is in is one of the first 40 names, maybe even 50 names that you say when you think of the University of Miami. Now, when if, if you're asking me about, you know, who have been some of the best QBs we've had in this decade or in the last 15 years, I think Ja'Cory is top three, like I said, top two. I, I think he provided us with moments that, you know, that, that win over FSU is, is, like I said, it's the last biggest it's – our, it's our biggest upset road victory we've had in the last 15 years. Outside of Miami going to Virginia Tech in 2005 and shutting down Marcus Vick, but that wasn't even like – that wasn't even a great QB performance. That was our defense just absolutely wiping the floor with Vick. So, that, um, that, uh, that 2009 FSU game, like I talk about that game – Maybe more than any other Hurricanes game yeah. in my lifetime. That game was nuts. That throw he threw, that threw, uh, oh my God, that pass he threw to Travis Benjamin on that last drive at the corner, that's one of the greatest yeah. passes you will ever see. It was, and I, and people don't remember, that was a broken play. That wasn't, that was, I think that play 
was like supposed to be like a fullback screen to 